Tonight, torrential downpours. The chaotic weather now affects India as heavy rains batter several regions, leaving many vulnerable to floods. Shanshan strikes. Southwestern Japan braced for one of the strongest storms to ever hit the region, with strong advice for residents in its path to evacuate. Swing state battle. Trump and Harris aim for battleground states with their final stretch of campaigning as the November election date looms. The Paralympics begin. A glorious ceremony kicks off the games in the city of light, surrounded by joyful cheer. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News Tonight. Bring it to you our latest updates for today. I'm Amasha Fernando. We have a lot of fresh updates to bring to you this evening, starting off with India. Severe weather continues to plague the region as Delhi's traffic police issued alerts to warn residents of severe flooding in several parts of the Indian capital following heavy rains overnight. Footage captured showed heavy traffic jams and vehicles moving slowly on severely flooded roads. Commuters were also seen wading slowly through shin-deep floodwaters on the streets. India has experienced torrential rainfall and extreme heat waves in cities across the country in the past few months. In June, torrential rain caused a fatal roof collapse in New Delhi, flooded underpasses, traffic jams, as well as power and water outages. Experts say India needs to dig more lakes and ponds to store heavy rainfalls, which can prevent massive water shortages. Southwestern Japan braced for what officials say could be one of the strongest storms to even hit the region, as some residents in the path of Typhoon Shinshang was ordered to evacuate, and major firms like Toyota closed factories. Officials say the storm could be one of the strongest to ever hit the region. Major firms like Toyota closed their factories while airlines and rail operators cancelled some services. Sansan is barreling towards the main southwestern island of Kyushu, with wind gusts of up to 157 miles per hour. An emergency warning was issued by Japan's meteorological agency, saying the typhoon could bring flooding, landslides, and wind strong enough to knock down some houses. In Gamagori, rescue personnel carried a survivor out from under their damaged home to safety, following a landslide triggered by heavy rain brought on by the typhoon. The meteorological agency said the typhoon is expected to strike Kyushu over the next few days. From there, it's set to approach central and eastern regions around the weekend, including Tokyo. Sansan is the latest harsh weather system to hit Japan. It follows last weekend's Typhoon Ample, which also led to blackouts and evacuations. Bangladesh's interim government, led by Nobel laureate Muhammad Yunus, had lifted a ban on the Jamaat e Islam party that was imposed under an anti terrorism law. The Ministry of Home Affairs revoked the ban on the country's largest Muslim party put in place the last days of the former Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's administration, accusing its members for fomenting unrest during the student uprising that led to her resignation. A Gazette notification issued by the caretaker government said there was no specific evidence of involvement of Jamaat and its affiliates in terrorist activities. The party had denied allegations that it stoked violence during the protests, which saw students take a stand against a quota system for government jobs, condemning the ban as illegal, extrajudicial and unconstitutional. Jamaat-e-Islami, which has millions of supporters, was banned in 2013 from contesting elections after high court judges ruled its charter violated the secular constitution of the Muslim-majority nation of 170 million people. The party was subsequently excluded from successive elections in 2014, 2018 and in January of this year, when 76-year-old Hasina won her fifth term in wildly discredited polls without credible opposition. Hasina's government banned the party on the 1st of August, just four days before she was removed from power after weeks of student-led protests, fleeing to India by helicopter. 
Sir Keir Starmer had said the government's desire to reset relations with the European Union does not mean reversing the Brexit. The Prime Minister said he wanted a closer relationship with the Europe, but the UK had no plans for a youth mobility scheme which could give young people in the EU to live and work in the UK and vice versa. For more on this, we have other there in the world news special correspondent Pawani Sihara Mudalige from Essex in the UK. Yes, Sir Marsha. Sir Keir was speaking at a joint news conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz in Berlin. After the pair began talks on a new cooperation agreement between the two nations, the PM said the agreement aimed to boost trade, create jobs and deliver economic growth in both countries. The two leaders hoped to sign a treaty uh, covering areas including defence, energy security, science and technology by early next year. During the visit, they also agreed a joint action plan to tackle illegal migration and smuggling gangs by sharing intelligence and data. Sir Keir has previously said he will seek a better deal on trade with the EU than the one negotiated by Boris Johnson in late 2020. However, it remains unclear whether Brussels would entertain major changes to the UK's existing Brexit trade deal, which is due to be reviewed in 2026. A youth mobility scheme, which would make it easier for you a citizen aged 18 to 30 to study and work in the UK for a limited period, with young Britons allowed to do the same in Europe in return, has been proposed by the EU. Back to you, Amasha. Thank you. That was Other There in the World News Special Correspondent Pawani Singhara Mudalige from Essex in the UK. Scientists studying the new mpox strain that has spread out in the Democratic Republic of Congo say the virus is changing faster than expected and often in areas which experts lack the funding and equipment to properly track it. Dr. Dimye Agoina is an infectious diseases expert in Nigeria who chairs the World Health Organization's Mpox Emergency Committee. We don't have uh, the required knowledge about mpox, natural history, uh, transmission dynamics, uh, risk factors of mpox. You need to understand your disease for you to develop or design preventive strategies ag ag against such a disease. Mpox, formerly known as monkeypox, is a viral infection that causes pus-filled lesions and flu-like symptoms. Cases are usually mild, but they can be deadly. The virus has been around in Africa for decades, but an international surge in 2022 prompted the WHO to declare a global health emergency for about 10 months. Now there's a new strain and a new WHO emergency declaration. The situation constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. The UN agency says Congo has had more than 600 MPOX deaths this year and more than 18,000 suspected cases of the new strain and its earlier iteration. <laughs> there have been cases in four other African countries, as well as in Sweden and Thailand among people who had traveled to Africa. Scientists say a response is complicated by several outbreaks happening at once. In some cases, the spread has been linked to human contact with infected animals. It can also spread through close contact with an infected person. Mutated versions of the virus can essentially be considered a sexually transmitted disease, says South African epidemiologist Dr. Salim Abdul Karim, who chairs the Africa CDC's MPOX Advisory Committee. It's case identification, contact tracing, and vaccinating and monitoring and treating, uh, giving prophylaxis to contacts. So it's, this is not rocket science. We do this for other infections. And so we can do it for MPOX. An Africa CDC senior official said on Wednesday that the continent has secured less than 10% of an estimated $245 million needed to fight the surging outbreak. And there's no timeline yet on when hundreds of thousands of vaccine doses might reach the DRC. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On road to the White House tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris is in historic coastal city in Georgia, a crucial presidential election battleground that one of the seven states that will likely determine her winner of the 2024 face-off with former President Trump. 
the vice president kicked off a two-day bus swing in southeastern Georgia, accompanied by her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz, visiting with faculty and students at a high school before stopping by a barbecue joint. Harris and Waltz will sit for their first major interview before the vice president holds what's expected to be a large rally in Savannah. By choosing the Peach State for her first campaign trail swing following last week's Democratic National Convention, Harris is making a statement that Georgia is once again in play in November's election. Georgia had long been a reliably red state in White House elections until President Biden narrowly edged then-President Trump in 2020 to become the first Democrat in nearly three decades to capture the state. Fast forward to this year's election and Trump saw his slight edge in the polls in Georgia over Biden jump to a solid single-digit lead after the president's disastrous performance in their one debate, a late June showdown in Atlanta. Israel continues its offensive in the occupied West Bank, with large-scale raids and airstrikes being carried out Wednesday. The UN Food Agency also halting Gaza staff movements, the Gaza Strip, after its team came under fire near an Israeli checkpoint. With Israel continuing its offensives in Gaza, its military is also expanding attacks in the occupied West Bank. The Israeli military on Wednesday carried out raids and airstrikes in northern regions of the West Bank, killing at least 10 Palestinians. The Israel Defense Forces said that it was part of a counter-terror operation, combining the use of drones and bulldozers, but also military and security forces. Israeli Foreign Minister Israel Katz said the latest operation aims to thwart Islamic Iranian terrorist infrastructure, adding that Tehran was looking to form an eastern front against Israel. He added that threats in the West Bank must be dealt with in the same way as in Gaza. An IDF spokesperson said Wednesday that Israel had identified the smuggling of weapons and explosives into the region by Iran. Meanwhile, the humanitarian situation in Gaza may further worsen as the World Food Program announced it will be halting all aid movement in the enclave. This comes as one of its vehicles was hit with repeated gunfire close to an Israeli checkpoint. The agency said that despite the vehicle being clearly marked and having received multiple clearances by Israeli authorities to approach the checkpoint, the vehicle was fired at repeatedly. None of the passengers were harmed, but an image released by the WFP showed that at least 10 bullets hit the vehicle. The agency has been crucial in its distribution of food throughout Gaza as famine has been widespread for months. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights also reported Wednesday that the Israeli military bombed a car passing through a Syrian border checkpoint near the Lebanese border, killing four people. The civil war monitoring group said a car exploded in a drone attack and that three Palestinians and one Lebanese national were killed. However, according to a Reuters report citing a local security source, the three Palestinians were members of the Islamic Jihad, while the Lebanese national was a member of Hezbollah. French authorities handed preliminary charges to Telegram CEO Pavel Duro for allowing alleged criminal activity on his messaging app and barred him from leaving France pending further investigations. Telegram founder Pavel Durov has been put under formal investigation and released under judicial supervision over allegations his messaging service is being used for illegal activities. Allegations include that the platform is being used for child sexual abuse material, drug trafficking, fraud and abetting organised crime transactions. Earlier this week, President Emmanuel Macron denied political motivations were at play. It is up to the judiciary and full independence to enforce the law. The arrest of the president of Telegram on French soil took place as part of an ongoing judicial investigation. It is in no way a political decision. It is up to the judges to rule on the matter. But the Kremlin claims otherwise, saying Durov's detention caused shock throughout the world. Following Durov's arrest, Telegram sent in a statement that it abides by EU laws and its moderation is within industry standards. The climate concerns grow as a study shows wildfires in Canada's forests last year release more greenhouse gases than some of the world's largest emitting countries. That's according to a study published on Wednesday in the journal Nature. 
fires scorched about 37 million acres across the country, or about 4% of Canada's forests. That adds up to 647 megatons of carbon, more than seven of the 10 biggest national emitters in 2022. Study author Brendan Byrne is an atmospheric scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Climate change, driven by the burning of fossil fuels, is leading to hotter and drier conditions, which propels extreme fires. Byrne says 2023 could become Canada's new normal. The findings add to concerns about depending on the world's forests to act as a long-term carbon sink for industrial emissions, when fires could be making the problem worse. Canada does not include natural phenomena like wildfires in its annual greenhouse gas emissions inventory according to a 2021 strategy. Though the fear is the global carbon budget may be based on inaccurate calculations. That budget is the estimated amount of greenhouse gases the world can keep emitting while holding warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration said SpaceX's Workhouse Falcon 9 rocket had been grounded after falling attempt to land back on the Earth during a routine Starlink mission, forcing the company's second grounding this year. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration has grounded SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket, according to the agency on Wednesday. It follows a failure of a routine landing attempt during a Starlink mission, and this marks the second time the FAA has grounded SpaceX this year. It may also delay SpaceX's Polaris Dawn mission, which plans to send four private astronauts on the first commercial spacewalk. On Wednesday morning, the rocket successfully launched Starlink satellites into orbit from Florida, but when it attempted to land on a barge, the rocket fell into the ocean after a fiery touchdown. Two, one, Falcon 9 rockets are essential for launching satellites and people into space, so groundings are rare. The last time was July, when a second stage failure lost a batch of Starlink satellites. No satellites or people were in danger during Wednesday's flight, but the landing failure suggests a problem with the rocket that the FAA believes could pose a risk in future missions if not properly investigated. The Polaris Dawn mission was already delayed twice this week, over a helium leak and bad weather. In late September, Falcon 9 is also set to launch two NASA astronauts on a Crew Dragon spacecraft. The same mission is set to eventually bring home two astronauts stranded on the International Space Station, who arrived on Boeing's troubled Starliner craft. NASA oversees Falcon 9 for its missions, but it's unclear how the latest grounding will affect them. Since its first launch in 2010, SpaceX has built a large fleet of reusable Falcon boosters, enabling it to launch more frequently than its competitors. The booster that failed on Wednesday was on its 23rd flight. Let's go for a short commercial break. More World News right after this. Welcome back. French President Emmanuel Macron declared the Paralympic Games open after glorious ceremony in which competitors were celebrated by joyful volunteers and spectators on a sweet summer night. Even before the opening ceremony of the Paralympics began, the celebration had already begun as those carrying the Olympic flame converged in Paris, among them disabled athletes and their supporters. As with the Olympics, the opening ceremony of the Paralympics happened outdoors in the heart of Paris, but this time under clear weather, complete with the flyover of jets painting the sky red, white and blue. At Place de la Concorde, which will host events of the Paralympics, dancers jumped on pianos and the French pop group Christine and the Queens performed. The Parade of Nations happened down the Champs-Élysées with the Arc de Triomphe looming in the background. <laughs> Athletes and fans have once again come to Paris, filled with the Olympic spirit. Organizers say almost two million tickets have been sold. The ceremony culminated with the lighting of the Olympic cauldron, which had already become a point of interest since its debut at the Olympics. The flame will fly over the City of Lights until the Paralympic Games conclude on September 8th. 
And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest updates across the globe. Stay tuned as Anuradhi Vikramasinghe will join you next with the nightly business report. Have a good night.